Good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, March the 7th. I hereby call local co local government committee to order. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Representatives Alexander, Burkhart, Carr, Doggett, Hale, Haynes, Holsclaw, Love, Martin, McKenzie, Miller, Moon, Raper, Reedy, Rudd, Shaw, Slater, Stevens, Thompson, Here. Vice Chairman Wright, Here. Chairman Crawford. Mr. Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Today we got 11 bills on the calendar. Uh, does any of the members have any personal orders or announcements? Seeing none, we'll get started. As usual, committee, I will try to take care of the chairman and get them back to their committees, but we have several members uh, at this time that are presenting bills and needs to be in other committees. So be patient with everybody coming in and going out. Item number one on the agenda is House Bill 1548 by Leader Lambreth. Got a proper motion and a second. Leader Lambreth, I have received a two-thirds majority resolution. It is in my office. You're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We want to make sure we, we got that to you. And uh, this is just a local private act for the city of Gallatin. Any questions for the sponsor? Question has been called. All those in favor of moving House Bill 1540 out, out to calendar and rules, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Chairman Boyd. Item number two, House Bill 1532 by Chairman Weed. We got a proper motion in second. I have received a resolution of two-thirds resolution. It's in my office if you'd like to look at it. Chairman Boyd, you're recognized on your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of committee. So members of the city of Lebanon just recently hired an assistant city attorney. And so what this would do is it would authorize the uh, assistant city attorney in the absence of the city attorney to uh, authorize to approve as to form all contracts, deeds, bonds, ordinances, resolutions, or other documents to be signed to the name of or made by the city. Any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, looks like we're ready to vote. All those in favor of moving House Bill 1532 out to calendar and rules, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. I believe you got the next one too. House Bill 1531 by Chairman Boyd. Do I have a motion? Proper motion and second. I do have the uh, resolutions two third majority. You're recognized on your uh, bill, Chairman thank, Boyd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of the committee. So this resolution asks that the uh, legislature increase the threshold for public advertising and still competitive bids from 25,000 uh, to what the General Assembly passed last year, which is 50,000. Uh, this is for the city of Lebanon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions for the sponsor? Seeing none, I think we're ready to vote. All in favor of House Bill 1531, moving on to calendar and rules, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Item number four by Chairman White is off notice. Which brings us to our wonderful Mr. Chairman Keesling. Proper motion in second. Chairman Keesling, I do see that your bill has an amendment. Can you please give me your drafting code? I would be glad, sir, and thank you for those kind remarks. That drafting code is 4915, according to my... That memo. is correct. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, sir. Got, we've got a proper motion and second on the amendment. We'll go ahead and put the amendment on the if bill. If you would, please, yes. Uh, it, so it can be discussed. All those in favor of House Amendment number 4915 going on the bill, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The amendment's now on the bill. Chairman, you thank are recognized you. on your bill. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, members. The uh, House Bill 1045 is relative to party registration. 
And the uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just briefly explain the uh, the amendment, and then quickly uh, I'll get on into the uh, the bill. It we do have we do have people to speak, so you, uh, at yeah, your convenience. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And um, but anyway, the um, the amendment itself. Uh, we've got three changes here, folks, that we that we did. And uh, one, the first one, it changes the requirement to vote in a primary from being a bona fide member and, of and affiliated with the party to being a bona fide member and, of or being registered as affiliated with the party. Now, if you'll find if you go to the those of you who may have the bill pulled up itself, that that change is found in uh, two point two. Uh, uh, 2.7 uh, dash 115 subdivision B with uh, yeah in uh, division one. Now the second change uh, changes the requirement that the parties must be statewide parties. That's 2 dash 7 dash 115 sub B with division two, and finally the third one is 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 a new section that's been added, uh, and it's describing the definition of an unaffiliated voter. Two point one point uh, dot one oh four uh, with, and then again that's a new definition. So, what we have here, and I'll just briefly go to my my text. and give you just an overview, and then I'll make a quick introduction on our guest. In 1972, the General Assembly completely rewrote the election code for the state of Tennessee. This is Title II of the current Tennessee Code Annotated. And now in that language, General, the General Assembly said that the voter must be a bona fide member of a political party to vote in that party's primary elections. They also required that the voter must be affiliated with that party and provided if the voter wasn't with the party, then they, the voter, must declare allegiance to the party and publicly state they intended to affiliate with the party. They also established that to do so, falsely carry the penalty of one to six, uh, one, six years, uh, one to six years in prison and a possible $3,000 fine. But in 06, Nafee came along, yes, Speaker Nafee, and Lieutenant John Wilder passed legislation to double that penalty to two, uh, 12 years and in prison for five, uh, with a $5,000 fine. And Governor Bredesen signed that legislation into law on June 20 of that year. That, ladies uh, and gentlemen, was the original closed primaries legislation. Now, for the past 50 years, we have had closed primaries. The fact that this penalty was not and has not been enforced very much, though, does not change the fact. The bill today does not change that. The bill actually is about party registration and party registration only. To say anything different is to ignore the past 50 years. The bill actually helps the voter avoid the threat of a penalty should they properly vote in a primary. This bill also helps potential candidates identify their supporters more quickly without having to wait the one to two years for the voter to establish a voting record. That's very important. This bill helps each party to better focus on their new constituents, to better educate these new voters on party principles and opportunities. The bill focuses upon the new voters in Tennessee uh, whether there's someone moving here from another state or that 17-year-old voter registering for the first time. The bill gives currently registered voters the opportunity to affiliate without having to do anything more than going to vote as they normally would have done. And also gives the County Election Commission guidance on how to handle these new and currently registered voters. And it gives the statewide political parties latitude to allow certain voters to to vote in their primaries. Mr. Chairman, uh, with that, I do have, if you will, uh, and I'll quickly I, I understand, and they already understand that they have to uh, once they get seated. But uh, would you 
will we proceed out of session then at this this time? Yeah, I I have three speakers that you have listed, so we will unless the committee has any questions for you at this point. Without objection, we'll go out of session to hear testimony. We are now out of session. The first witness I have is Valerie Williams. Miss Williams, if you will have a seat there, turn the microphone on. It's a little red light. Give us your name and who you're with. Hi, I'm Valerie Williams, and I'm just a private citizen, not with any organization. <clears throat> you have three minutes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I live in Williamson County. Uh, my daughter graduated from Ravenwood High there in 2009. My career was as a computer systems analyst for a major telecom company. Today, I'm here to speak in favor of passing Bill 1045. This bill will seamlessly begin party registration for every person newly registering to vote. It's merely one added question on the form that they already have to do. For all others, when they vote, their party choice is recorded and set as their selected party. This is easy, seamless, and logical. Anyone can change their selected party easily as well. We have partisan primaries in our state. <clears throat> what is the purpose of a partisan primary? It is to have each party select their choice of candidate to run in the general election. The party chooses a candidate. By our existing laws, it states that if you choose to vote in a party primary, you're declaring that you intend to join that party. Everyone has a choice. We've all joined a party or not. There are consequences to our choices, however. When you choose a party, it's somewhat like joining a family. And as in a family, we don't always agree with everything all the time. We have common outlooks, though, and goals for the most part. So if you think of this analogy, if my family is deciding where to go on vacation, half of us say Disneyland and the other half want to go to Hawaii, and then our neighbor decides he would like to be part of our family for this trip, and so he says, I'm joining your family now, and I pick Disneyland. He's never paid any money to our family, never helped with any chores, doesn't have any shared outlook or goals, and he may walk away from our family at any time. But do we have to count his vote in our family's decision on where to go on vacation? If we follow the current voting rules in Tennessee, yes, his vote counts. So we go to Disneyland. Does this make sense? No. And it doesn't make sense in our elections either. You worry about folks complaining they are disenfranchised if you pass this bill, as they can no longer feel free to vote on any party ballot at any time they choose. I'm telling you that I am disenfranchised if you do not pass Bill 1045, and I'll explain why. I have joined fully into my party. I've paid my dues. I've gone to meetings. I have and do support my party candidates. I've donated to candidates until it hurts, and I've volunteered many hours of my time for my party and its candidates. When I go to vote in my partisan primary, and you allow people who have done zero for my party, and many never intend to support my party, and some could possibly, in truth, want my candidates and my party to fail, when you allow that to happen, you have disenfranchised me. It negates the value of my vote. For each person that you allow to cross over and vote in a party that they have not joined and not supported, you have canceled out one of your loyal party members' votes. Please vote yes on HB 1045. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Williams. Uh, does any of the committee have any questions for Mrs. Williams? Representative Miller. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi. Ms. Williams, you, you mentioned family and you use that as an analogy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as you were speaking about family, I want to ask you a question that in your family, do you have siblings of voting age? You recognize Ms. Williams? Yes. If you had one of your siblings that wanted to vote as an independent in your family. Um, but this bill would pretty much deny that. Uh, how well, would you, how no, would this you... bill actually um, allows the party to decide if they want to allow independence. So, I mean, it doesn't rule out that. 
Representative Miller. If if the if the party, let's say Republican Party, wanted to deny your family member to vote as an independent in their primary, how would you feel about that? Mrs. Williams. Well, that person makes a choice whether to affiliate or not. So if that family member wants to be part of that family, they can choose to be. We don't deny anybody the choice of joining the family. It's their decision whether they join or not. So if they don't choose to be part of the family, then they don't get to vote in the family. Any other questions for Mrs. Williams? Seeing none, Mrs. Williams, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, I will recognize Jim Sandman. Sandman. Mr. Sandman, if you will give us your name, who you're with, you have three minutes, sir. Good afternoon, Chairman. Thank you for this time. My name is Jim Sandman. I live down in Christiana, Tennessee. I'm a Navy submarine veteran. And for full disclosure, I'm a uh, state executive committee member for the 13th district here. Uh, I was one of the yes votes for last December when we passed a resolution for party registration. Uh, it passed 42 to 21. Previous testimony uh, stated that this bill would make it harder for voters to select the representatives of their choice. It does no such thing, really. And in a primary, a Democrat voter can vote for any Democrat on the ballot and a Republican can vote for any Republican on the ballot. And in the general election, everyone, including an independent voter who has previously decided not to affiliate with a party, can select their choice. When a party chooses to have a primary via an election versus a caucus or convention, yes, taxpayer funds are made available, as Chairman Rudd pointed out on February 21st. It's precisely because primary elections are paid for with tax dollars that we should ensure election integrity, especially party election integrity. Democrats vote in their primaries and Republicans vote in their primaries. And the unaffiliated can affiliate if they choose to. It's just common sense. This legislation does allow in Section 5 each party to open their primary elections to independents. Also, Tennessee's dismal voter participation rate is not potentially worsened by this bill, as stated in previous testimony. Voter participation is improved by voter education with an informed electorate that pays attention to their local and state and federal elections or federal government. And no voter is being left out of the process of electing their representatives by this bill. Independent voters can still vote in the general election if they choose not to register as a Democrat or Republican. It's their choice not to register. And military veterans like me will still have the freedom to vote as we wish. There is currently no federal prohibition on voting your conscience, only on expressing political views publicly while representing the military, which to me sounds a little like federal overreach anyway. Why is the Department of Defense limiting free speech of veterans who are fighting for the right of free speech, among other God-given rights? But that's an issue for another debate. This bill does not hamper veterans or anyone's voting rights in any way. It simply makes the process more honest, which everyone wants, right? And in closing, and in regards to the sacredness of voting rights, my distant second cousin, Mark Twain, said in 1905, quote, but in this country, we have one great privilege, which they don't have in other countries. When a thing gets to be absolutely unbearable, the people can rise up and throw it off. That's the finest asset we've got, the ballot box, unquote. Let's help keep the ballot box honest and support this party registration bill. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sandman. Uh, Representative uh, Shaw, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, listen carefully to your testimony and to the one prior. Um, I have experienced uh, people pressuring people to vote certain ways, not necessarily making them because they have a choice, but I've seen, uh, does this, uh, would this legislation make it easier for someone to be pressured to vote a certain way in your opinion, sir? Mr. Sandman, you're recognized. No, sir, I don't see that at all happening. Uh, is, is The person still has a choice whether they would want to affiliate or not. Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
Would you agree or disagree that a person pretty well make up their mind by the time they reach the voting age that they want to be affiliated with a certain party? Uh, it's been my experience, and that really doesn't change too often once a person make their mind up they want to do that. Uh, would you not agree to that, sir? Mr. Mm -hmm. Sandman, you're recognized. Yes, uh, they have that choice when once they reach the voting age. Um, that shouldn't prevent them. Follow up, Mr. Shaw? Yes, yeah, so I, I guess I wonder then why do we need this legislation because I uh, pretty well know how I'm going to vote in an election. I know pretty much who I am, what I stand for, what I believe, and I think most citizens do. Uh, and I guess that's, of course, you can't answer this question, but I guess that's the reason why I'm wondering why we need this legislation, because I think in Tennessee, and particularly, we have a pretty good voting record, uh, and we've done well. There's no voter fraud. Uh, we come out, I think, number one and number two uh, in the whole nation. So... I guess I just keep wondering why we keep changing voting laws when we're doing well is, is what I'm wondering. And I'm, I don't expect you to answer that, sir. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Mr. Sandman? I believe there's a song in there. <laughs> Mr. Sandman. I believe so. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Everybody's out of order with me. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, uh, next on the list, we have uh, Chairman Scott Golden. Chairman, please give us your name, who you're with, and you will have three minutes, sir. There it is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Scott Golden. I'm the chairman of the Tennessee Republican Party. I uh, just want to thank the committee. I really want to thank uh, Chairman Kiesling for his effort in this legislation. Um, Representative Shaw brought up a great point, which was what is the purpose of the need? And we do do well in controlling one of the best states in the nation as far as uh, election integrity is concerned. Uh, but the reason for this legislation is, is that there have been instances, documented instances, where we have had known Democrats that have affiliated with Democrats that have purposefully voted in a Republican primary they have uh, sought to influence the outcome of that election. Uh, this was a case that went back to 2018 in Williamson County, where a candidate running as for the Democrat nomination for county commissioner voted in the Republican primary so he could choose his opponent. So these cases have been documented. And of course, you know, they have not, as Chairman Kiesling said, they haven't been adjudicated. Um, one of the reasons is, is that we that we hope to solve that issue with the ability for voters to identify publicly with a party one or the other. This piece of legislation also has the addition that you can be an independent. You can still remain as an independent and then choose at the time of the election, which party that you intend to vote in. Um, so that's, that's an added piece to this, that this piece of legislation that may not been in, in other pieces. So it gives the voter more flexibility. But the general concern is, and the ethos of the Republican Party, is we want to make it easy to vote and hard to cheat. And that's what the purpose of this legislation is for. Um, I thank the committee for their time. I appreciate the amount of effort that they put into this and look forward to answering any questions. Representative Shaw. Thank you, and thank you, Scott, for being here. It's good to see you. Good thank see you, you so sir. much. Uh, and and I, I appreciate what you said, but that's been both ways. I've seen the same thing happen with the Republican Party. Yes, sir. So I, I don't, want it, don't want the public to be misled that it's only Democrats cheating. I'm not taking up for Democrats, <laughs> but it's both ways here. So uh, let's make sure we clear that up. But... I, I still don't know why what we're going to solve when we do this, because you're giving the voter that flexibility, but that voter can still do what you just said, even when we pass this legislation. 
So I'm not for sure we are solving problems, but maybe creating more problems or giving people more of an opportunity to create problems. But I would say most of our voters in Tennessee are honest people. And my time up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Boy, that was quick. But I, I I'm, I'm still asking that question, what is the real purpose for the legislation? Chairman Golden, you're recognized. You're exactly right. And uh, there have been certainly, I would say, one of the uh, instances when in 2008, when former radio uh, host Rush Limbaugh encouraged people to vote in a different primary, Republicans to vote in the Democrat primary for president. So uh, it, it does happen. But ultimately, that's what this legislation would fix. It does give the voter the chance to maneuver. You're right. But uh, but once they're a registered Republican or a registered Democrat, they would not be allowed to be given a ballot for the opposite party's primary. Representative Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I've been involved in politics for over 50 years and i uh, I've heard all of these accusations about Democrats voting in the Republican primary and vice versa uh, in some mass conspiracy, but I've never seen any mass conspiracy actually happen. Uh, you mentioned one Democrat who was trying to pick his... Uh, Republican challenger. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was doing this by himself. Is that right? Chairman Goldman? I, I have no evidence of what he was doing. We just know that he was, there was no way that he intended, as the law currently states, to identify with the party that he was voting in, knowing that he was a Democrat candidate nominee for the same office. So I don't know if he influenced 10 people or 2,000, but that case has been documented. Representative Thompson. Uh, do you know of any other uh, examples like that? Chairman or is that, your, uh, is that the only one? Well, that was a pretty high profile one because, again, you had an example of a Democrat candidate voting in a Republican primary, not necessarily a Democrat voter voting in a Republican primary. Representative Thompson for follow-up? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so you're, you're, you know of only one example who – of one person, or maybe a few more, but no mass example. So, so, so essentially, the only thing I can conclude by what you're saying is this is a extremely rare occurrence, and it's not really a problem um, that either people of my party or your party have, uh, have uh, tend to claim from time to time. Thank Chairman you. Golden, you want to respond to that? Yes, sir. So uh, rare is is your characterization. I would say that it it, it is not. Um, it is certainly a percentage, but when you're talking about Republican or Democrat primaries that are decided by a few hundred votes, then obviously that one percentage. I would say another high profile example was when uh, the Democrat Party uh, unseated Senator Rosalind Corita. Uh, because of crossover voting that was alleged during that district, that was that uh, of where Republicans were accused of voting for her, and she was removed uh, by their Democrat state executive committee. So, they, so they, we've had some high-profile issues, but to say that it's rare, it's probably minimal. But in races that are very tight, minimal can make the difference. Any other questions for Chairman Golan? Representative Miller, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Mr. I, I remember our conversations yes, earlier in, in the subcommittee. And, and, and just to kind of follow up on some of the things that uh, Chairman Shaw was speaking of, who would suffer under this bill would be the independent voters, the legitimate independent voters of this state not the cheaters, hopefully not the lawbreakers, but some do think that they have been breaking the law, those independent voters, for a long time in this state. But at the end of the day, based on the conversation you're having, this is pretty rare. In other words, 90% of the legitimate independent voters in this state, whoever they are, will suffer under this 
because they will no longer be able to vote in a primary, legitimate independence. And I said it to you earlier, if you look up the makeup of this state currently, Republican legislators versus Democratic legislators, this is the, one of the best examples. There's a supermajority of, of Republicans elected to this General Assembly. It's been this way for a long, long time. I'm thinking most independents in the past have actually voted for Republicans. Would you say yes or no to that? Chairman Golden. Well, I've been in politics long enough to remember when it was a majority Democrat party, and then now it's a majority Republican party. So at some point in time, those voters certainly started um, voting Republican. Representative Miller. And, and I say to you that at, at one point I thought maybe I should consider supporting this bill. I don't think I will. And the reason for that is based on exactly what you just said. That independent voter at one point in time decided we're going to vote Democratic. The other time they decided, as of today, we're going to vote with the Republicans. But what we're doing now is taking that away from them. That's what we want to do. And I say we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't take that right away from the independent voters, the legitimate independent voters. In the Chairman Golden? So in this legislation, I, the independents are still allowed to vote in the primary. And so if you are a true independent, you would see no change um, in how you voted in 2022 and how you vote in 2024. Any other questions for Mr. Golden? Chairman, if I may. You're recognized. Before, before uh, Mr. Golden leaves, the, may I, I'd like to just point out something that, uh, or ask him. Earlier today, uh, he and I had a conversation, and, and it was obviously regarding this bill. Uh, and it's whether we do it, Today or sometime in the future, would you would you mind conveying to yeah. to the members of the committee uh, what you what you told me, so, Scott? Uh, I, Chairman Gohm. Thank you. Uh, I told Chairman Keesley, and I said, "Look, my my concern is is that I look long term, and unfortunately, I do believe there will be a day. Now, I'll say it may be bipartisan, where there were one party working with." Uh, one party's effort is to be involved in the primaries as opposed to be involved in the general. And we are seeing evidence of this nationally where in the 2022, we have seen Democrats that were running ads in favor of certain Republicans in primaries. This was happening nationwide. And unfortunately at some point in time, it's going to happen in Tennessee. And I, and I, like I said, I think that we need to be, this bill helps us protect election integrity going forward. Um, I don't know that, you know, again, I pointed to the Corita example. Maybe that was was an example. But but I think, unfortunately, as, as we move forward in the nature of politics, the, 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 it seems to be that the rules are getting disregarded. And um, and what was once taboo is now kind of out in the front with when you see parties advertising to try to pick who their opponents are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing him to see that. I no, know he went over his time. There. No problem. Thank uh, thank you, Mr. Gomes, for being with Thanks, us today. Uh, at this time, we have some people that want to speak. Leslie Collum, please give us your name who you're with, and you have three minutes when you start. Chairman Crawford, Vice Chairman Wright, members, good afternoon. My name is Leslie Collum, and I am the first Vice President of the League of Women Voters of Tennessee. The League is a volunteer organization that is nonpartisan and encourages informed and active participation of citizens in government. I am speaking today in opposition 
to House Bill 1045 that would transform Tennessee into a state with closed partisan primaries. We feel closing primaries has the potential to further reduce Tennessee's dismal voter participation rate as younger voters and many veterans are not wishing to affiliate with either the Republican or the Democratic Party. This will also affect voters who identify as independent or with minor third parties, such as the Libertarian Party. Many local elections in Tennessee, such as those for county commission, local school boards, and even some general assembly races are decided in a partisan primary, not in the general election. If this bill were to become law, then only members of a political party would be selecting those public officials, even though those officials will be representing all the citizens in that particular district. Closing the primaries would disenfranchise those voters that do not wish to have an affiliation with a particular political party, become a part of their permanent voter registration record, but do wish to be involved in the selection of their government officials. Please do not limit the ability of Tennessee citizens to be involved in the selection of the elected officials that will serve them. Thank you, Mrs. Collum. Is there any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you for being with us today. At this time, we will have uh, Shannon Rasmussen. I'm, I know I destroyed that. You can give us credit. You're recognized. Give us your name and who you're with, and you have three minutes. Thank you so much, Chairman Crawford. My name is Shannon Rasmussen. I'm an Army veteran, and I appreciate being included in this conversation. During the 2020 election cycle, Tennessee was one of 15 states that mobilized National Guard soldiers. 26 troops staffed additional polling sites to meet social distancing requirements, and they were specifically told not to show up in uniform to avoid the appearance of military involvement in a polling place. DOD demands political neutrality of its service members, and this bill would punish them for those views. There is arguably no community more directly impacted by state and national leaders than active duty, reserve, and National Guard soldiers. Representatives at all levels have the authority to select leaders, initiate action, create regulations, recommend candidates for service academies, and authorize funding. This bill would limit service members' ability to choose the leaders who make those decisions. Through four committees and two different bills, we've heard countless arguments for protecting party sovereignty, preventing crossover voting, and preserving Tennessee's existing law, but no acknowledgement of the bill's impact on independent military voters. No one has addressed the fact that about 50% of veteran voters will be excluded from primary elections because they are politically neutral. No one has acknowledged the hypocrisy of a system that invites voters to cast their vote in dedication to a service member, while that same system prevents some service members from choosing the names that appear on the ballot. Furthermore, there are faulty assumptions being offered. The first is that any Tennessean who votes for two different parties in two consecutive elections must be cheating. This demonstrates a complete failure to understand nonpartisan voters who vote for candidates rather than parties. The other assumption is if we can prove that some crossover voters were cheating, we can safely assume they all were. Imagine a scenario where one Tennessee lawmaker misstates his credentials during a campaign and voters assume that all legislators must be doing the same. I hope you'll remember poll workers like Michelle Wild from District 46. She has served at Tennessee's polls for nine years, and she already encounters hostility when she tells unaffiliated voters they are not able to participate in primary elections. She anticipates this bill will create a, the need for additional security if it passes, because so many will be unaware of the need to re-register. The benefits you hope to gain by passing this bill will be offset by the price you will pay to get them. You might gain tighter control of your ballot, but you'll exclude the very people who defend this system, our system of government, from helping to shape the ballot. I'm asking you to honor our military and vote against HB 1045. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any questions for Ms. Russellman? 
Seeing none, thank you for being with us thank today. You. And last on my list, I have Tom Johnson. Please give us your name, who you're with, and you'll have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Chairman Crawford. Turn your mic on there, a little red light. Nope. Testing. Yeah, you're good. Right. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman Crawford and committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Johnson, and I live in House District 53. I'm speaking today as an independent voter in defense of open primaries, but also in defense of crossover voters. Proponents of this bill say Democrats may be voting in Republican primaries or vice versa with nefarious intent, trying to elevate weaker candidates to the opposite party's ticket so their own candidates have a better chance than general. A witness at the March 1st hearing of the Elections and Campaign Finance Subcommittee cited her personal experience running for office last year in Sumner County. She lost her Republican primary by 19 votes with 46 votes cast by Democratic voters. And she apparently blames her loss on their participation, though it's unclear what leads her to believe they favored her opponent. But even if we assume Democrats wanted her to lose, was it really because they thought she'd be tougher to beat for their own party's nominee? As it turns out, the general election for that seat didn't even have a Republican on the ballot, just an independent, and the Republican won with a whopping 76% of the vote. In fact, less than half of Sumner County races featured a Democrat, and Republicans won every single time, usually by a landslide. With that kind of one-party dominance, it's understandable if voters see Republican victory as a foregone conclusion and victory by anyone else as a pipe dream. Can you blame them for wanting to have a say in which Republican will be sworn in? Would you deny citizens that scrap of representation unless they put on a team jersey? And should conservatives in a blue city like Memphis not have a say in which Democrats govern their town? Now, I've read the text of HB 1045 uh, before Representative Kiesling announced uh, those revisions, and I will say I'm glad it doesn't include the recent proposal to automatically assign voters to a party based on the last primary they voted in. Making someone officially a Democrat or Republican without their express consent goes against freedom of association. I was concerned, though, by language in Section 4, which set forth this requirement, quote, the voter is a bona fide member of and is recorded on the voter's permanent registration record as being affiliated with the political party in whose primary the voter seeks to vote. So you may recall the U.S. House race in District 5 in which the state GOP blocked three candidates, including one endorsed by President Trump, from competing in its primary, declaring they were not bona fide Republicans. So we should wonder, with this bona fide standard codified, and I understand it's still going to remain in the 1972 Act that was invoked in the 2008 18 Williamson County case, what prevents parties from imposing arbitrary criteria on voters to help the candidates they prefer? As a final thought, not everything is about red versus blue. Sometimes you just want to support a candidate based on things like character, experience, and skill. Let's validate these things that transcend party lines and make Tennesseans a more unified people. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you. Seeing none, uh, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate you. your testimony. Uh, the chair will take privilege, and at this time I'd like to recognize legal on um, something that was said. We need to make sure that everyone understands stands it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Hughes from Legal Services. Uh, just a point of clarification about the uh, bona fide status of uh, the members is that the bona fide status is, is set by the parties themselves and it isn't there's nothing in the state law saying what bona fide means it just requires uh nominees to be bona fide members of the party any questions for legal on that all right thank you legal uh without objection we'll go back into session and uh, we're now back in session is there any questions for the sponsor representative shaw 
I would like for you, Mr. Sponsor, to tell me the real reason why you're bringing this bill. I highly respect you, worked with you for years. I believe you're a good person. And, and to be perfectly honest, as I sit here and think, and as I've looked back in the past, I don't think it's that much difference in any of us that are good candidates. I, I, I may totally be wrong when I say this, but I think how you vote is in your heart is what I really believe because I think you want to be fair to people. That's what I believe. I don't think I ever want to do anything to hurt anybody, whether I'm a Democrat, and that's why I'm a Democrat is because I believe in honesty. I believe in integrity. I've been in this government for 23 years, and nobody in my district will ever tell you I cheated or done them wrong in any way whatsoever. Always projected good character, good personality, et cetera, and so forth. So why are we bringing this legislation? Chairman Keesling. Thank you for, thank you for your kind remarks. Representative Shaw, I appreciate that. And you know I love you, brother. I the only thing that the, the only way that I can answer that again is because of Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter what party you are. The bottom line in the summary of physical no, nails it down for me. It permits political parties, Democrat or Republican, to allow unaffiliated voters to participate in a primary election, their primary election, to choose a primary election. So that that's the bottom line. I, I, uh, this, this, this was brought to me, um, didn't have to convince me very much. I, I just, I just felt like there's so many, uh, unaffiliated folks that, uh, there's going to be elections that they, they want to vote in a, for a Republican. They may, or they want to vote in a, for a Democrat. You guys have been very uh, kind today, very attentive, and I appreciate that. Uh, from from your districts, I know that uh, probably each of you have received a lot of comments, emails, phone calls, and uh, you're going to vote the way you, uh, you, you feel that your constituency wants you to. This, this to me, I, I, you know, I haven't taken anyone's temperature. I haven't taken this committee's temperature from the very beginning. But uh, I do appreciate each and every one of you. And you uh, it's just go, it goes back to uh, what Mr. Golden said. Sooner or later, we're, we're gonna, we may find ourselves, who knows, if this thing goes down today, then it goes down. You know, we've just given it a, an effort. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know what else I can say. Uh, I'm just going to toss it back to you, sir. Chairman Rudd, you're recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sponsor. I'm going to appreciate you uh, for bringing this. I want to I want to say this. I have um, I first got involved in Republican politics as a volunteer in 1984, and since 1984, long before I ever ran for office, I've worked in over 200 campaigns. I have worked in the rain. I've worked in the snow. I've gone door to door. I've raised money. I have put up signs. I have worn myself out because I worked for a political party whose, whose ideology I believed in, whose platform I believed in and promoted. And, you know, my father was a Democrat and my mother was a Republican, and I grew <laughs> up uh, more of a Democrat than a Republican. And when I was in college, I had to make a choice. And I have worked tirelessly at the precinct level as treasurer of the party as of 18 years as an elected state committeeman. Literally, I've worked my rear end off for the beliefs that I believe in. This bill is needed. It's warranted. It was voted out of subcommittee. Uh, the amendment, as I understand it, would allow independents to vote in either party's primary now. It would just prevent Democrats from voting in the Republican primary and Republicans from voting in the Democrat primary. We have two political parties because our ideological beliefs are different. Our platforms are different on most issues, not all issues. And there are two parties for a reason. And, uh, you know, earlier it was in testimony that independent voters and independent veterans would be disenfranchised. Not under this amendment. That's not true. Independents can vote in the primaries. That has been the main argument I've heard 
since I've been up here for almost seven years that we're allowing independents to be disenfranchised. They are not under this bill. It only prevents each party from crossing over into each other's primary. And I think it's a good bill. It's needed. And if you truly are a Republican, you shouldn't be voting in another party's primary. And if you truly are a Democrat, you shouldn't be voting in the other party's primary. And we all can vote in the general election for each party's nominee or for an independent. But uh, this is a good bill. I thank you for the amendment, and I thank you for the speakers on both sides of the argument. And again, thank you, and I'm voting for the bill enthusiastically, and uh, God bless you. Thank you. Representative Love, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the sponsor. Uh, the last speaker, prior to my colleague, raised an important point that I had not thought about. So I'll ask you this question. What happens in a district like mine that is majority Democrat, but may have some persons who are members of the Republican Party, and in a particular year when I might have two opponents in the primary and there are no Republicans running in the primary, and they'd like to support a candidate who they deem has done a decent job of representing the district and want to vote for me, would they be allowed to if this bill passes? Chairman, you're recognized. So let, let, me, let me see if I've got this nailed down out of the question. You and you have two other opponents running. There's, it's a three-person race. Is that what you you stated? Now? Correct. Okay. For the Democratic primary. In a I'm Democratic sorry. primary. Okay. Again, this, the, the Republican can't come in into your primary, well, legally speaking, and vote. Representative Shaw, I mean, I'm sorry. And I, I'll, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll defer to the, to, to the, uh, to legal if, if I've made a misstatement on that, well, Chairman. Representative Love, go ahead. Okay, um, we'll have to go out of session. And legal, you're recognized to answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Josh Houston, Legal Services. Uh, Representative Love, I. Your question is if there was uh, a Democratic primary, but there were Republican voters with no Republican primary, and they wanted to vote in the Democratic primary, if this bill were to pass, they would not be able to vote in your primary because they were, if they're registered as a, as a Republican voter. Okay, we'll go back into session. Representative Love, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and that was the point that, that I wanted to raise. Uh, because actually, 2016, I had two opponents, Democratic primary. And because of how my district is situated in Nashville, uh, I've had Republicans who live in the district who say to me, hey, you're my representative. I'm in a different party, but you're my representative. And they say I've done a decent job. You know, they say I've done a decent job of representing them and the whole district. And the point is, if they don't have a candidate in their primary, and it's not the presidential election primary, it's in our primary, because normally the presidential preference is in the spring, then if this bill passes, they won't be able to choose who they may deem is a better candidate, even if that person is not a member of their party. And I think that's why I do have a little bit of concern because they don't have a candidate from their party in the primary. They identify somebody who is seeking to be elected as their state representative who just happens to be on the other party's ballot, and that person has 
one or two opponents, and they may have concerns about whether that decent state representative is going to get reelected, and they want to engage the process, and we would say to them, you can't engage, and whoever wins is going to be your representative without you having any voting choice in it. And I, have, I do have issue with, because those, it could happen because of the dynamics of our city and state when it comes to the way our districts are drawn uh, in any of our areas. So I appreciate you bringing, I understand why, but for me, that's, that's where I have some difficulty because like I said, I know in, in my area where I represent, there are persons who are of various uh, party affiliations. Chairman Rudd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, in a roundabout way of getting to what I'm going to say, I, I see uh, Chairman Hoseclaw at the bottom there. And uh, a couple of years ago, he passed a law called the hands-free law, said you can't operate your cell phone in a car. Of course, I was not supportive of that. <laughs> But it's the law, <laughs> and I abide by it. I do not touch my phone unless it's an emergency, unless it's on a holder. I, it's inconvenient. It's uncomfortable. It's very inconvenient at times if, you're, if your car is moving and you're not stopped. Uh, same thing on the HOV lanes. Every morning when I'm coming in and my 90-minute drive in the morning, I see car after car after car during that two-hour period that the HOV lanes are enforced that people, every every car goes by me is one person in the car. They're all breaking the law for their convenience. I respect the law, so I don't get in an HOV lane. It is frustrating to see just car after car, and I know I'm going to be late for a meeting. But I abide the law because I'm a lawmaker, and I respect the law, even if it's a law I don't agree with unless it's violating the Constitution. I abide by the law, even if it doesn't benefit me personally. And right now, this law doesn't change the current law. The current law, it says it's illegal to cross over vote. The only thing this would change is it's only illegal for two political parties. Independents could do it now and not break the law, as I understand it. So it would free up independents and unaffiliated voters. Um, we have to respect our laws. And if we don't, why do we have them? Why do we have party affiliation? Why do we have political parties? Why don't we just do away with them and everybody's an independent and shut the parties down in Tennessee if we're going to do this? We have to respect the law. And right now, the law that we currently have and have had, I believe it's what, for 50 years that you can't cross over is not being abided by out of convenience and or political expediency. And we need to start obeying the law. I can't think of any law that's ever been up here. And I have both carried them and voted for them that closed primaries that is more forgiving and more open than this because it does not enforce affiliated, unaffiliated voters, does not take away their right to cross over in a primary. Uh, this does it for each political party. But again, thank you for bringing it, and I want to clarify that. We've got to respect our laws. Thank you. Chairman Moon. Uh, Representative Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to the sponsor, I have a question with regard to the conversation that I was hearing about if uh, you had three Democrats in a race and you didn't have a Republican, that Republicans in that community could not vote is the scenario that was laid out. My question is this, isn't it true that if those Republicans wanted to register to vote in that Democratic primary 30 days in advance, that they could do that? Is that true or false? Chairman, you're recognized. I would think that is true. Thank you. Representative Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to make sure I understand this procedure, uh, if I wanted to, if I were a Republican, wanted to vote in a Democratic primary or vice versa, what process would I do? Chairman Keesling. By statute, you can't. You have to stay. Again, we go back, and I think it's a misdemeanor. We could get legal to correct me on that. But but right now, by law, you're not allowed to. Back to, to uh, Chairman Rudd's comments, um, he addressed that just, just a few moments ago, if I understand that correct, if I understand your question correctly. Representative Thompson, for a follow-up. 
Um, yeah, I don't think I was very clear. Uh, suppose I wanted to change over one party to the other. What what process would I do, Chairman Keesling? I'm not. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not versed in the uh, in in election law myself. I don't know if you have to. Uh, I don't know if you have to uh, register 30 days out or not. I don't, there's a, there's a time frame. I I think legal can uh, can uh, could help me on that, but I think that's right. It's great. It is. Okay. Representative Thompson. Okay. I mean, if you're having to do this bureaucratic procedure of going to your election commission, changing something, filling out a form or whatever, it seems like this taking away freedom from a lot of people in this state. We've, we've gotten along pretty well for a long time, the current system, and um, I just don't see a practical reason for changing. Yeah, I appreciate your opinion, of course. Representative Shaw. Well, thank you. And that brings up uh, the conversation that's been had here the last few minutes, bring up something uh, that happened to me about I'm starting my 23rd year here. Representative Shaw. Yes. Sir. Just for a moment. Do you need a water, sir? Can we get you a water? Um, if we're not going to be too much longer, I'm all right. I can last. Okay. Thank you. Go Thank ahead. you, Chairman. I appreciate that. Go ahead. Yes. About halfway here, when I was around my 10th term, somewhere about, I had a Republican to run against me. Now, I know this for a fact. And those Republicans did not vote, did not register 30 days out to vote for me. In fact, I had Republicans to give me money. And Scott might remember this. They gave me money because they gave it to me in a very secret, quiet way, which I appreciate very much. <laughs> I hope you reported that, Representative Shaw. <laughs> I reported the money, but I... It, we'll never I tell anyone. Will Bill we? Young's back there in the back right there. Yes. Raise your hand, Bill. <laughs> I reported the money and I reported the names, but they didn't come to my house and give me the money, okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> but but my, my question is this. Were they, did they break the law? Chairman Keesling? Again, these are Republicans who came into your Democratic primary election. No, they they just voted for me. In they gen, voted the for general, me like, over the yes because they voted for me over and against their own candidate in the general election, in Rep both primary and general. Shaw. Chairman, okay, that's what I'm asking. I mean, were they breaking the law, Chairman Keesley? If thank you, Chairman, if they came in, if that Republican or Republicans plural came into your Democratic primary, by law, they broke the law. Well. Representative Shaw. <laughs> thank you, Mr. I'll Trump. stand corrected, though, legal. Representative Shaw. Thank you, sir. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to get to here. It looked like to me we're impeding people to pick and to choose, as my colleague to my right just said, because sometimes people – just looking for the person rather than the party, and uh, I, I don't I don't want to put, put people in a position where they have to break the law to do something. I want them to have the freedom to do that, and I think that's what voting is about: is freedom. Chairman Keesling. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Representative Shaw. Again, I, I'm going to go back to my my previous comments. I. Uh, <laughs> whether we do it we may never you know we may never get uh, get past today for, for that matter um I, I don't know again i'll repeat it permits political parties to allow unaffiliated voters to participate in their primary elections that's the bottom line any that's other questions for the sponsor mr chairman question has been called that's non-debatable uh I don't see any objection, so we'll go ahead and vote on House Bill 1045. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. No. Nay. Nay. Thank you for your time, members. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman.
Item number six, House Bill 910 by Representative Gillespie. Is he in here? Representative Gillespie, we'll roll this to the hill of the calendar without objection. Next item on our list is House Bill 853 by Representative Leatherwood. Without objection, it will be rolled one week. House Bill 1547 by Representative Butler. See in here? There he comes. Proper motion. Second, uh, Representative Butler, I do have the two-thirds majority resolution that was sent to my office. At this time, you're recognized on your bill, sir. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. This was brought to me by the City of Livingston, which is in Overton County, to amend a few items in their charter. Uh, and if you've looked at the bill, I don't mind to read those, but it allows for a four-year mayoral term, alderman for a four-year term. Candidates to be elected in the 2024 election will assume office on the first day of September, following the election and serve till June 30th, 2028. Thereafter, their successors will assume office on the first day following the July election. Candidates in the 2026 will assume office on the first day of September, following the election and serve until June 30th. 2030. Thereafter, their successors will assume office on the first day of July following the election. So this that's what this does. It just amends the city charter. And of course, there's a requirement for that to go through the General Assembly to make those adjustments. No qu Thank you. question has been called on the bill. Without objection, we're that's voting easy. on House Bill 1547. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. If you want to be Thank recorded you, as a no, please see the clerk. Next on our list is number item number nine, House Bill 183 by Chairman Whitson. Got a proper motion in second. I do see, Chairman Whitson, that we have a uh, an amendment on your bill. Can you please give us your drafting code? <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have amendment number 4425. Proper motion and second on the amendment. Would you like for us to go ahead and place the amendment to be discussed? I request that. All please, those Mr. in Chair. favor of amendment number 4425 uh, going on the bill, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. <laughs> Ayes have it. It's now on the bill. You're recognized. Thank Welcome. you, Mr. Chairman and committee. This bill is designed to simplify and clarify certain procedures for the registry of election finance. These are considered to be procedural rather than substance changes and are intended to simplify the code and make certain procedures match others currently in use. In many instances, these changes are intended to, to outline certain existing requirements by statute rather than through rulemaking. These procedures affected by the legislation includes procedures for reporting campaign finance data, treatment and maintenance of campaign funds, addressing sworn complaints, the assessment of civil penalties, addressing administrative procedures and proceedings, excuse me, and the annual reports by the registry. With that, Mr. Chairman, I renew my motion. You've heard the discussion of the amended Bill 183. Is there any questions for the sponsor? Question has been called on the bill. Without Thank objection, you, we're ready to vote on House Bill 183. All those in favor, wait just a minute. We do have uh, we do have some people to speak. Uh, Chairman, you're recognized. Uh, they're, they're available only if there was uh, questions on the bill, sir. Okay. Do you want me to go out of session for them to speak? No, sir. I okay. think we got it covered. All right. Without objection, we're voting on House Bill 183. All those in favor, please say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Your bill moves on to calendar and rules. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. I am going to back up here, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, on House Bill 1547 that passed Representative Butler's bill. I did not tell what committee that went to next. So uh, that House Bill 1547 moves on to calendar and rules. All right. Item number 10, House Bill 0879. Representative Carr from your seat. Proper motion and second. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This bill here is a real good bill. It's about self-insurance. As you know, uh, under the current uh, government uh, tort 
Liability Act, government entities can replace private insurance companies and in activities related to their own operations by forming their own pool of funds. And for 25 years, the Tennessee Housing Authorities have been doing this. But now, in order to get low-income housings, we issue low-income housing tax credits now, or L uh, low a L H I T C. And sometimes um, these uh, priorities, they have to go out and get insurance themselves, which makes it so much higher. They can buy insurance by, by one-third to one-tenth less if they could insure themselves. And the current law in Tennessee Housing Authority Risk Management Trust is formed under, does not allow for existing self-insurance pool to insure the low-income housing tax credits. Therefore, this bill would allow them to insure themselves, and that is just what we're trying to do, to allow them the same able to insure themselves as we do in the Tennessee Housing Authority Risk Management Trust Act. Chairman and, Moon, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the sponsor for bringing this bill. Affordable housing is very short supply in this state, and this will lower the cost and help in every way. I totally support the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other questions thank for you. the sponsor? Seeing none, we're ready to vote on House Bill 38, no, I'm sorry, on House Bill 879. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Moves on to finance, ways, and means. Item Thank 11. Thank you, Chairman of the Committee. House Bill 389 by Representative Wright. Vice Chairman Wright, you're recognized. I do see that we have uh, an amendment on this bill. Can you please give us your drafting code? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee. The drafting code on the amendment is 4812. That is correct. Do I have a Proper motion, sir, second. Second on the amendment. Do you want us to place the amendment on the bill to be discussed? All those in favor of amendment 4812 going on the bill, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Your bill's now amended. You're recognized, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any testimony to be received on this today? I do have people on here. Would you like for us to go out of session at this time? Yes. Okay, without objection, we will go out of session. And we have uh, Deborah Fisher. Ms. Fisher, please give us your name, who you're with, and you will have three minutes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I'm Deborah Fisher. I am Executive Director of Tennessee Coalition for Open Government, and this is a bill um, that... Um, we have had concern with because it opens up county and or allows members of county and municipal legislative bodies to basically hold hybrid meetings where some people attend by phone or video um, and others don't. Um, our organization during COVID did do some surveys related to this and one related to how those kinds of meetings went and probably the most unpopular meetings in the ones that citizens had the hardest time following were the hybrid meetings. And the bill allows people to attend by either any way, video, phone, video or phone. And it does require the chair to see the person on the phone, but most local legislative bodies are not like this, like with a big screen where you're going to have someone on the screen the whole time. It doesn't even require someone to be on the video or the phone for the whole meeting. So we have concerns about opening this up to the legislative bodies in local areas. It's one step away from this legislative body. And, um, and uh, particularly of concern are the reasons. One of the reasons is for family or medical emergencies. And we're concerned that that is a broad, um, uh, it's not defined in the bill. And it could be basically whatever you want it to be. A family emergency could be my daughter needs to go to soccer practice. And I've got to take her because our car broke, my husband's car broke down, he can't take her. So we're very concerned that it will be abused, possibly unfairly applied. And um, we're asking you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Is there any questions for the sponsor, for the speaker? Thank you, Ms. Fisher, for being with us today. Thank you. Without objection, we'll go back into session. Sponsor, you're recognized on your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, hey, as presented much. in the subcommittee, and allow me to plow a little bit of ground that was in the subcommittee for then here at the full committee, 
uh, in code currently 55106, every member of the county legislative body shall be required to attend each and every session of the body and allowed to vote and draw pay for attendance. Uh, this is initially coded in 1887, updated in 1932, and again in 1978. Item 11 on today's agenda, which is House Bill 389, authorizes a member of the local government's legislative body to participate in a scheduled meeting by electronic means only in three occurrences. If the member is dealing with a family medical emergency, has been called into military service, or is unable to attend in person due to inclement weather. More specifically, four other items must be included. The participant can only participate through electronic means only if the person can be identified visually by the chair. A quorum must exist at the physical location of the meeting, not to exceed three members being electronically added and the individual member not participating electronically more than two times in a year. All meetings conducted by electronic means must remain open and accessible to the public with real-time live audio or video access to the public. A clear audio or video recording of the meeting must be made available to the public not more than two business days after the meeting. And in the notice of the meeting, information provided about how to access real-time live broadcast. Now, the purpose of the amendment was to clarify the word that I had used earlier at this point in my presentation, which was the bill is permissive. In the amendment, in the new language, a county legislative body may, a county legislative body may, by resolution, allow members of the legislative body to participate in a scheduled meeting by electronic means to clarify this is permissive. Again, as I explained the bill in subcommittee and just now currently, all of the other things remain the same. Uh, with that explanation, Mr. Chairman, committee, I stand for questions. Anyone have any questions for the sponsor? Representative Reedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, uh, Chairman Wright, this bill gives me quite the pause. Um, I'll call my wife out on this because she's a county commissioner, which means she's one of my county commissioners that I get to vote for. And just like she, with me being here, I'm expected to be here for these people in this auditorium to, to see me testify for or against a piece of legislation. It's the same thing I expect of my county commissioner, my wife, for whatever reason. And yes, there's family emergencies that she needs to take care of. And I'm okay with her saying, I'm, I'm absent. So I know that she's not somewhere on her cell phone, taking a vote, having a conversation. Me personally, I believe we're all duly elected and we should be there in person to fulfill our obligation. And for that reason, Mr. Chairman, I have got to vote against this bill. Thank you. Any other questions for the sponsor? Representative Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did I hear you say, Mr. Sponsor, that they could only do two video meetings a year? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is correct. No participant more than two times per year. 
Otherwise, they would have to be there in person. Right. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, I was right. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, right. you're recognized. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that's correct. You can only do this twice a year, which would mean that those two particular meetings, you were able to participate in the meeting and represent the thousands of folks that elected you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Representative. Um, you know, I, I realize and, and recognize that <clears throat> during COVID a few years ago, we had some unprecedented times and there was some necessities that needed to be made so that uh, the continuance of government um, could go forth. And so we we did make some exceptions for local governments on how they could could conduct their meetings. And uh, there were a lot of issues with that, a lot of struggles and with our uh, the members of our communities, many had difficulties being able to to view those meetings and to be in attendance virtually. Uh, you know, as I read through this, I, I share some of the concerns that I have with uh, another member that has already spoken. And you know, I think about the the exceptions, the following reasons as to why someone could could request to, to do these meetings virtually, uh, dealing with a family or medical emergency, um, being called in the military service or un unable to attend due to inclement weather. All three of those things, I would think that a person who is experiencing those types of instances may not be in the mentally there in that moment to be able to perform uh, their duties and make those decisions for their constituency. Now, I know that we come here every day and we all, everyone in this room, uh, we all experience life and life throws different curveballs to us each and every day. We all have troubles that we go through and things that, that we try to set aside when we come here to work through the people's business. But I can only imagine being in a in a family emergency and then trying to dial in on my phone to be a a vote on the on the budget for my county commission or take up a matter of issues that involves uh, you know our our local sheriff's department and law enforcement committee or whatever the deal may be that we're voting on in the in the local county commission on that day. I I just think it's a can be a dangerous precedent, and I understand being permissive is is a good thing when we look at things for counties. But, um, you know, I think there's some things that need to be looked at and considered going forward. Maybe pull back some some things and work on this more. I I would make a motion that this would be summer studied to examine the possibility of this uh, further. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Proper and properly seconded, we'll be voting on sending this bill to summer study without objection. All those in favor of sending House Bill, uh, let me make sure I get the right one. 389. 389 to summer study. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. We're back on your bill, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As most recently pointed out, the problem could be that a person not be of sound mind while participating via video. I can also offer extenuating circumstances where a person could have had a hip replacement or a knee replacement and not allowed to move from their residence to the meeting place of county commission. With that being considered, if a county legislative body wishes to have video interaction, there would be people represented at that meeting that would otherwise be not represented. Also, I want to give one other, and this is these are real live examples. Another example, an at-large commissioner whose father lives in California could be in California where the parent had had a heart attack and still be of sound enough mind to contribute 
to the meeting at hand for the monthly meeting of the legislative body. Now then, for those that disagree with this, for their county commissioner's sake, their county commissioner would not have to participate in this program. This only allows county participation or legislative body participation where that body by resolution wants to participate under the limits that are laid out in this bill. Representative Martin. I move the previous question, Mr. Chairman. Previous question has been called. Uh, all those in favor of House Bill 389, moving on to finance, ways, and means, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Committee. Yes, sir. We've got one thing we need to back up on. We're running out of time, about two minutes. So without objection, I am going to roll House Bill 091 to the uh, one week. Without objection, one week. It's rolled. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We're adjourned.